Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience in holding. We now have your presenters in conference. Please be aware each of your lines is in a listen-only mode. You may submit your questions electronically anytime using the chat pod located to the right of your webinar platform. You may also download a copy of today's slides using the files pod located below the slide presentation. It is now my pleasure to turn the conference over to today's first presenter, Chris Hunt. Please go ahead. Thanks, Stephanie. Hi, everybody. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you might be. Welcome to the April 2020 AHA Team Training uh, Monthly Webinar. This one is on addressing disruptive behaviors in healthcare. This is Chris Hunt, Senior Director with the American Hospital Association Center for Health Innovation. Uh, I'd just like to start um, thanking you not only from a personal level, but from all of us at the AHA for all of the amazing work that I know you're doing right now. Whether you're on the front lines dealing directly with patients or you're behind the scenes uh, helping coming up with different ways of training the workforce or training students or, or whatever it is that you're doing right now, uh, I, we all really appreciate everything that, that you're up to. Uh, we're sitting, you know, we're not even in the balcony of the theater. We're, we're, we're totally outside of it. Uh, so we really appreciate what you're doing to keep us all safe. Thank you very much. Uh, today's webinar has uh, similar rules of engagement as always. Uh, you can listen to the webinar two different ways. Uh, you could listen through your computer, uh, which might be the easiest way, especially if you're, you're at home right now and listening online, which I'm assuming a lot of you are, which is a, a difference for us. Or uh, you could listen through your phone. If you're listening through your phone, you're going to want to do a little something different than normal. So normally, we'd have you mute your computer speakers, but there's a video, a brief video in this presentation. And so if you're listening with your phone, you're going to want to go up to the little green speaker icon that's at the top of your screen right now, and you're going to want to choose mute conference audio only. So that's something you want to do if you're listening with your phone. If you're listening to your computer speakers, uh, no, no worry. We'll do a Q&A session at the end of this presentation. Uh, that's how we try to do things. Uh, so if you are interested in asking a question, and we encourage that, please use the chat box that you see and type in your question. And if it's something that we could answer as we're going, we'll answer it. Uh, if it's something that we think everybody would like to hear the answer to, we'll save it to the end. And I run a little Q&A with the speaker at the end using your question. Uh, if we don't get to your question, uh, what we'll do is we'll make sure to get that answered for you, or you could send that question to teamtraining at aha.org. Uh, something else to note is that you can download the slides uh, from the webinar today uh, in the file pod that you see on your screen. You can get continuing education credit for this. Uh, so to receive one continuing education credit for this webinar, uh, you have to do a few different steps. Uh, make sure you've created a Duke OneLink account. Instructions on how to do that can be found in that file pod that I've already talked about, or you could email us with any questions. You must have your mobile number updated in there before you text in the code that we have on the screen. And so the code for today's webinar is H A X P. E N, And so you have to do that within 24 hours of the webinar, but if you do that, you receive credit, and that credit is a continuing, continuing education credit for physicians, nurses, pharmacy, and allied health professions. Some upcoming announcements on team training events. Uh, so because of the current situation of COVID-19, we we've canceled some of our courses right now. Uh, our courses are going to resume hopefully later this summer and into the fall. So if you're interested in any of that, uh, you could follow the hyperlink that we have on the screen right now. Uh, we also are, are closely monitoring the situation, so expect an announcement regarding the AHA Team Training National Conference soon. Uh, webinar next month 
uh, you could register for our, our May monthly webinar, which is going to be on the 13th at uh, noon Eastern. And that is going to be uh, on high performance teamwork uh, and incident management. So also a very timely webinar for uh, what's going on in the world right now. All right, without further ado, I'm going to get to now introduce uh, today's presenter, Dr. Kyle Rader, who is the medical director at the Duke Center for Healthcare Safety and Quality, but he wears a lot of other hats besides that. He's the physician quality officer with the Duke University Health System. Uh, he's the director of the PCPM Fellowship at Duke Children's Hospital and is also an associate professor of pediatrics there. So uh, Dr. Rader is a very busy guy, and I really appreciate him being on. I know that you'll, I think, really appreciate his presentation here uh, on disruptive behavior. He's a fantastic presenter. I've, I've had a chance to hear him many times before, and I'm really excited to be able to introduce my friend, Dr. Kyle Rader. Thank you so much, Chris, and uh, thank you everyone for joining in the midst of everything that's going on. I know a lot of you um, are busy and uh, really appreciate seeing so many faces uh, who've logged in. So um, I also really want to echo uh, Chris's um, gratitude that he expressed to you all for the work that you're doing. My clinical home is in the pediatric ICU, and so I'm uh, having my time and my turn on the front lines. Uh, but the support system for everything uh, that is being done for, for COVID patients everywhere is, is so broad. And again, really just want to thank you all for all you're doing. So uh, moving forward into the topic. Uh, so obviously this seems like it is a popular topic and unfortunately it seems like it's a popular topic because I think it does resonate with a lot of people. So we're going to talk a little bit about disruptive behaviors in healthcare as much as we can in 40 minutes. Uh, so it's, it's a huge topic. And obviously, we could go a lot deeper into it, but certainly we're going to try to cover some of the, the broad things and then try to give you some practical tools that you can take with you to start to help address some of these disruptive behaviors that you may see in your own work settings. So first, of, first and foremost, we need to talk about what do these disruptive behaviors look like? Uh, why is it such a problem? And then again, uh, really want to leave you with some practical tools. What can we do about them? What are some tools that we can use to try to really fix these in the healthcare setting? So a lot of recognition that has come out about, uh, unfortunately, the incivility and disruptive behaviors, the rudeness that can be present in the hospital setting. Uh, so here you can see an article from the New York Times from just a few years ago talking about the fact that there is an increase in this in the last few years. And beyond that, even if you think about medical TV shows and medical movies that you'll see, there is always that disruptive character, and, and more often than not, it's a physician, but it may also be a nurse, and, and, and it's that character that you remember, you laugh at, but you, you really recognize that people are like that sometimes in the hospital setting. And so here you can see Dr. House and Dr. Cox and Nurse Ratchet, and the fact that every medical drama, every medical comedy has these people worked into it shows you how ingrained this is in, in hospital culture, in clinic culture, in, in healthcare in general, which is really what we're trying to address as we see this. So just for a moment, I'm going to ask you if you have a scrap of paper in front of you. I'd like you to draw what disruptive behaviors looks like. So a uh, little interaction uh, since we can't do it in person. But um, again, just a minute, draw a stick figure. This does not need to be a fancy drawing, but sketch something out that's an image to you. What, is disruptors, what does disruptive behaviors look like to you in your work setting? And so I'll give just a moment for people to do that. Again, this does not need to be fine art. Obviously, no one else is going to see it. And a lot, while we're doing that, I do hear, see one uh, comment in chat that there is no sound. I'm hoping everyone else is hearing me okay. Okay, and I get a, a confirmation from Jen that you can hear me, so I'll keep moving. So we're going to come back to this drawing in a few minutes. Uh, so along those lines, uh, fortunately, there has been increased recognition in the, last few, uh, in the last few years that these rude behaviors, these incivil behaviors, affect our ability to care for patients and directly affect patient care. And I'll show you some data that directly ties to that. But people realize that this is not okay. Not only does it set up a toxic work environment, but it directly affects our major mission, which is to care for patients. And so that has brought some attention into 
disruptive behaviors and what can we do about it? So at the baseline, how do we define it? Disruptive behavior is behavior that's contrary to the mission and values of the organization. And that's obviously a broad definition and a broad topic, but it can include, as we mentioned, incivility, unprofessionalism as a broad topic, rudeness. But another way to think about it is I know it when I see it. And this is what uh, a former Supreme Court justice this is how he described pornography. He says, well, in obscenity, I know it when I see it. And and you all can think of those times in the hospital where it's really shown up at, in a different way. And you say, wow, that's really unprofessional. That's not okay. And so along those lines, uh, on the same scrap of paper, if you can write down some of the disruptive behaviors that you have seen and just try to come up with at least four or five, I'll give you just a moment to do that. All right, so when we've done this as a group in person and we've talked with people about the different disruptive behaviors they've seen, some of the answers we get, uh, and I'm sure some of these are on your papers, yelling and screaming, bullying, intimidation of others, uh, obviously physical contact or throwing items, this concept of horizontal lateral violence where you're really setting up other people to fail, uh, particularly setting up peers to fail. Uh, we see belittling of others, demeaning of others, uh, trying to take away people's self-worth. You see inappropriate or discrimi uh, discriminatory comments that may be related to uh, race, may be related to gender, may be uh, inappropriate in other ways. Uh, maybe sexual harassment is something that you might have seen in your work workplace or maybe even experienced. The things that we often don't get written down as often but will still show up is passive disrespect and microaggressions. And, and I'm not going to delve too much into microaggressions, but certainly they fit within this bigger group of disruptive behaviors. And then the other one is avoiding others and refusing to communicate. And that's a time where it's something that's truly passive. You're not reaching out and, and affecting someone directly, but if you're not communicating key information in the moment, then you're being unprofessional as well, because as team members, we all need to be able to share that key information. And we'll talk about that in just a moment as well. So I'm gonna ask you all, uh, just think to yourself, in the last month at work, uh, how often do these things happen? So if, if this has happened in the last month, just kind of check it off to yourself as I go through the list. So the first of those, that you've been sexually harassed or discriminated against, that someone has raised their voice in anger to you, someone has belittled a decision or action that you made, that you've heard an inappropriate comment or joke, that someone has been rude to you or that you have avoided talking to someone because you know it's going to be a negative interaction. And so if you think about if any of those things got checked off for you, many of you are calling into this because you are leaders in your organization. You may have a leadership role or even if you don't have a leadership role, you're likely an influential person. And if so if these events are happening to you, think about that nurse who's brand new off orientation or that medical student who's just starting his internship who's coming in. And if these things are happening to you as a leader in your group, think about how often these things must be happening to those folks who don't have power and influence. And I'll take a moment and just highlight that last one again. Uh, and this gets into the cycle of disruptive behavior and the cycle of unprofessionalism. So you have had those rude experiences uh, with someone where they've talked poor you to talked poorly to you before, said things that are inappropriate, and, and we've all had that feeling where you just don't want to pick up the phone because you don't want to talk to them. And in that moment, as I highlighted previously, you are being unprofessional because you're not sharing critical information. You know the right thing to do is pick up and call, the, call that person to find that person to talk to them about what's going on maybe with a patient, what's going on with a project, but you're acting unprofessionally because of your previous experience with that person. And now you see where this disruptive behavior, this rudeness builds on itself, creates a cycle that breaks down communication and breaks down teamwork and only builds. And so this is why it's so, one of the reasons it's so important to address this. So how pervasive is it? So you all just did your own personal checklist. Uh, if we ask physicians uh, and nurses throughout the country, here's some data around that. So greater than 50% of physicians report that bullying harassment is a problem in their work area. If you look at all health disciplines, 88% um, of physicians, nurses, pharmacists feel like, you know, in the last year they've been spoken to condescendingly. 79% have seen a refusal to answer pages or answer calls. About half report strong verbal abuse. 
And then at the same time, if you ask doctors and nurses specifically, 71% uh, of the time can think of a time that these unprofessional behaviors have directly led to a medical error or contributed to a medical error. And a full quarter of those people surveyed said that they can think of a time that these behaviors contributed to the death of a patient. And so the impact of these is huge, and it directly, again, affects how we can care for patients in the healthcare setting. So the other problem is only about 34% of staff feel that these behaviors are addressed appropriately. And we know, and I'll show some data in a few minutes, that when these happen, we don't address them in the same way we do other medical errors. We don't address them in the same way we do other mistakes. We often sweep it under the rug. We ignore it because we don't want to cause that confrontation. And it's often that really verbal, really aggressive person who may be doing these things. It may be a person who's also in power who's doing these behaviors. And so it's harder to address in the moment. So this is data from a, a large healthcare system on the West Coast, uh, data that, that we uh, collected and analyzed. And it shows, as we know from previous studies, uh, that culture is local. So yes, you can look at the health system as a whole. And across that health system, 98% of work settings reported disruptive behaviors. About half of the staff reported disruptive behaviors. And in this particular study, we asked about six specific disruptive behaviors. We asked about physical aggression, bullying, inappropriate comments, public humiliation, and then turning back on turning your back on someone before a conversation is over or hanging up a phone before the conversation is over. And again, 98% of people said that that happens frequently in their work area. So it's, a, it's something that's very concerning that we see how prevalent that is. However, you see a huge difference between people who work in this fourth quartile and these work settings to the right where it is very prevalent and these things happen all the time and more than 60% of the staff says that happens frequently versus those places in the first quartile to the left uh, in that blue box and where those things, you know, less than 40% of the people say that it happens frequently and you even have a setting of work settings where no one reports that. Uh, it is a small number of work settings, but it's the case. And so there can be big differences. And as we look at this, the culture in these, in these areas is dramatically different and we'll show data on that in a minute. But it shows that disruptive behaviors are prevalent throughout almost all of our work settings, uh, albeit in different amounts, um, and m the majority of our staff are being exposed to these on a regular basis. So do we talk about this when it happens? So this was a survey, interesting survey that was done where they talked about some of these disruptive behaviors. And they said, if you see a medical error about to happen, how likely are you to speak up? Uh, and you can see that if it was a medical error, the yellow bar here, more than 60% of people said, yeah, I'm gonna speak up if I see a medical error about to happen, even if it's the attending who's about to do it. 70% uh, say, if I know that that medical error is gonna cause harm, I'm gonna speak up. It's still concerning that 30% of the people won't speak up even if they know that the harm is about to happen. However, what if that same attending is acting out in an unprofessional way? So same kind of you know, scenarios, questions asked, are you, would you speak up in that setting? And what we see is that only about 10% of people would speak up if they see the attending acting unprofessionally to say that's you know, not okay. And even if they can see that it's about to uh, risk a patient, cause serious patient harm, only about 20% of people would speak up. So four out of five people would keep their mouth shut, keep their head down because they don't wanna be involved in that. They don't wanna speak up. And so, as we mentioned before, these behaviors are often allowed to continue. So why do providers act out? Let's talk a little bit about that. And, and there's a lot of potential reasons, uh, and I'm sure you can come up with some of your own that you've seen. Uh, however, I'm gonna drop it into four big buckets. Uh, the first of those is fatigue and frustration. Obviously, this is something we deal with on a daily basis in the healthcare system. People have been working long hours. Uh, they may be fatigued for other reasons. They may be stressed. Uh, we deal with difficult situations that we see every day which cause emotional drainage on us, uh, it may cause you know, our own emotional distress. And so those things set us up. And, and the frustration also comes in that we're trying to do the right thing for our patient. And because of red tape, because of administrative rules, because of just the setting we work in, we may not be able to achieve the outcome that we want to achieve. And that creates frustration. So that's one of the big contributors. Another one is production pressure the constant pressure to do more with less resources. And what we see is that directly contributes to fatigue, frustration, burnout. We'll talk about it a little bit as well. Uh, so, but it's this constant pressure on us to do more with less. And so that's gonna build in and push people up to that breaking point. 
the lack of voice and the lack of control. I don't have a voice unless I scream. I don't have a voice unless I really shout and, and, and uh, you know, make a fuss. And then finally someone will pay attention to me. And so people get this where they learn that the only way to have that voice is to act out in an unprofessional way that gets them attention. And so when people don't have voice or don't have control over the work that they do, they're more likely to act out in unprofessional ways. And then the last one is role modeling and learned behavior. And so if we think about if we see this type of behavior in our setting and we see it not being addressed, then that tells us, hey, it must be okay to act out that way. Um, and so it's, again, this learned behavior. And it's this last bucket where I mentioned earlier this concept of more passive disrespect, more microaggressions that happen, which aren't these huge outbursts, but maybe these really kind of subtle demeaning comments that people work into their speech. That often comes into this bucket of this learned behavior, this, this uh, role modeling. Um, and so, the, you know, all of these contribute. And I see that someone, uh, Robert Hartle just asked, isn't the core of all these fear? And so for fear, certainly, I would say, is one of those things that contributes, but it's not always fear. Uh, you know, some people, sometimes it's not about being scared uh, of, of a certain outcome, but it's just I can't achieve what I want to achieve, and I act out that way. So all of those are playing in. And I also see that uh, Randy Pito com commented, which is a, a perfect point, if we think about what's going right now with COVID and the stress that this is adding, obviously, you know, it's really setting us up to only see more and more disruptive behaviors because people are stressed, people are fatigued, people, you know, are trying to do the right thing but can't do it because they don't have the resources. So um, it is really an apropos topic for what's going on right now. So another thing that we see going on is the amygdala hijack and some of you may have heard of this some of you may not have so i'll spend a moment talking about this so the amygdala is a little part of the brain you can see it highlighted there in the image on the left you can also see it highlighted on this um, mri pet scan on the right uh, when when that amygdala is activated and you can see uh, the activity within that part of the brain and so what we see is that the amygdala is the part of the brain that really controls your emotions. And when it gets activated, it floods your brain with endorphins, with cytokines, with an epinephrine, adrenaline, and those hormones, that the stress hormones that are released in that moment of high emotion take over the brain. And what we see is all of a sudden we lose control of our normal cognitive processes and that hulk comes out. And this, as our brain is washed with all these hormones, it, this typically lasts about 17 to 20 seconds for these hormones to kind of flood our brain and then dissipate. And if, if you look about how long Hulk was on the screen there, that was about 18 to 20 seconds. And so in those moments, our normal cognitive processes, the normal things, the governor that we have in our brain that prevent us from saying things that we may be thinking, we lose the ability to control that as well. And so we may act out, again, in those unprofessional ways. So just an example of this, uh, we'll watch a video real quick. and. Uh, you can see this is just an example again of that uh, amygdala hijack in the workplace. And my wife and I like to joke that there's few types of stress that, are more stress that, are, that affect you more than technology stress. And so I'm sure we've all felt like this with a computer at some point. And to get back to that concept of amygdala hijack, from the time that the gentleman slammed the computer monitor to the time that he stood up and kicked the computer monitor, and you could see him starting to come down from that hijack, it was, again, right about 17, 20 seconds. So that typical amount of time we see for um, this amygdala hijack happen. So that's some of the reasons, some of the psychology, some of the physiology behind these disruptive behaviors we see. Now I want to get into um, what are some of the consequences, and then finally, how can we deal with it? Uh, so I'm going to jump back on what images did you envision? What did you sketch out on your notepad in front of you um, at the beginning of this talk, uh, if you were joined with us then? And so again, when we do this in person, we often it's, it's really interesting the types of images that we see and how telling that is to what we experience with disruptive behaviors. So this is a common image where we'll see one person, we often see the angry eyes and the shout lines coming out from their mouth. Um, and you see all of these other workers scurrying away. And 
the thing that we often see is that person who's being disruptive is drawn much larger than everyone else in the picture. And I think it really represents the inordinate impact that one person can have in a work setting. And I know that you all can think of that one person who has this huge negative impact on your work culture because of their attitude, because of the way that they behave. Um, and so um, you know, we'll go back to the fact that these are uh, often a small number of people who have this huge impact. Uh, another image, again, that large person but stepping on others to get to their goal and everyone else just kind of gets crushed in their wake. Uh, we may see clicks form, um, and I know in the pre-questions that a lot of people asked about these is that, uh, you know, you see, again, this, this more passive behaviors but disrespect and, you know, talking about people behind each other's back, setting up others to fail. So this is another thing that we'll see often drawn out in, in image form. And then finally, this was one that I found really um, interesting when someone drew this out. And this talks about, again, that consequence of disruptive behavior and how does it make you feel. So think about a time that someone was rude to you in the workplace. And at the end of the day, you're driving home and you're thinking, thinking to yourself, ah, oh, I cannot believe they said that to me. What, what makes them think they can get away with it? What, you know, you're, you're just stewing over it as you're driving home. And as you're eating dinner, you're still thinking about it. And you're going to bed that night and you realize you can't get to sleep because you're still thinking about what that person said to you. And the next morning in the shower, you're thinking, oh, if I see them again today, boy, I'm, this is what I'm going to tell them. This, yeah, this is, I'm going to let loose on them. And so you're getting to the point where you're now 24 hours after someone made a single comment to you and you are still perseverating over that single comment. And this is the effect, the consequence of disruptive behaviors and how much it sticks with us. These negative things that we experience, we hold on to much, much stronger than we hold on to the positive things because we don't want to experience that negative feeling again. And so we perseverate, we, we think about how we can protect ourselves, and it's hard for us to focus on the task at hand. It's, it's, it's hard for us to get ready for the next thing that we need to do because we're just thinking about that one thing. And we're thinking about how we're going to respond to that person when we see them again. Um, and so all of those things then hurt our ability to do our work. So we know to that point that teams cannot function as well when they've experienced um, this, this incivility, this rudeness. Uh, and so there's two good studies that I'll highlight. Uh, these were both done in a simulated environment where teams were randomized uh, to do a medical resuscitation simulation and then some teams were exposed to rudeness and civility. It may have been a rude team member or it may have been a rude patient uh, right before they did their simulation. And uh, not surprisingly, the teams that were randomized um, to exposure to incivility uh, saw in inability to diagnose what was going on with the patient as quickly. They did not work together as well as a team. They didn't get to that treatment as fast. And so we saw reduced efficacy of the team. And so this was a study that was done in pediatrics and then a similar study that also saw a 28% decrease in performance. And then this last thing that's important is they saw, that they saw that the team was not aware that they weren't functioning as well. So it's just like being drunk. You don't realize you're drunk in the moment. Um, and so you are perseverating over that rude comment. You're perseverating over what happened. You're having trouble focusing, but you don't realize that you are impaired in that moment. And so this, this is what we see, again, the effect of disruptive behaviors on teams. So uh, going back to the data I showed you earlier, uh, this was data from that large health system on the West Coast, and uh, we broke it down into quartiles, the units that experienced disruptive behaviors frequently versus those that saw disruptive behaviors less frequency. And we broke it up here by quartiles. You can see that in red is the quartile that saw disruptive behaviors the most frequently, and in blue are those work settings where it was less frequent. Those are the places you'd like to work. And not surprisingly, we saw huge differences in teamwork climate, safety climate, job satisfaction, perceptions of the local manager or the lo local leader, poor work-life climate, personal burnout, the, the likelihood that I'm feeling exhausted, just can't face another day at work, and even personal depression, if you measure depression symptoms, when people are exposed to these disruptive behaviors. And you can see that almost for every single one of these, it's a stepwise pattern. So the more commonly you're exposed to these behaviors, the more people in your work setting that are exposed to these behaviors, the more likely you are to be burned out. The more likely your team is going to be dysfunctional because of that. Now these are associations. Um, and so there's a little bit of a chicken or egg argument here. You know, maybe we have poor teamwork and that's why people act out because they're more likely to be frustrated. And certainly that's true. Uh, but 
if people are, are if the teamwork is poor and I'm frustrated, I'm more likely to act out that way. The flip side is I'm acting inappropriately. That's going to break down teamwork and make teamwork uh, not work as well. Same thing for work-life balance, burnout, all of those things. And so pretty strong correlations at every level. You can see the statistical significance was true across the board. And so uh, it really this, these behaviors affect every aspect of our work culture. So some other consequences we see, we see that patients drop out. They start to go doctor shopping because they don't trust that. They don't want to be in that work setting or cared for in that environment. We see errors and complications go up. Uh, we see, not surprisingly, in, uh, increases in hospital-acquired conditions, whether it be pressure ulcers, falls, medical errors. We see increased lawsuits. The hospital reputation suffers. Um, we see on the employee side, or on the on the administration side, we see increased turnover in our staff in these work settings. We uh, mentioned burnout and the costs associated with that as well, harassment suits, and then the employee reputation. This is, you know, I don't want to go work there. People are horrible to each other there. That's not where I want to be. And so now you not only have increased turnover, but it's hard to hire good people in to fill those spots that are vacated. So, again, not surprising that uh, we see huge impacts on both the ability to care for patients, but also for the health system when we see more and more of these disruptive behaviors happening. So at the end of the day, what we see is this loss of psychological safety. And I know earlier the idea of fear was brought up, and this sets up a setting of where people are fearful to speak, fearful to speak up with concerns. Uh, when I speak up, I get yelled at, um, I, you know, I, and, and now I don't feel comfortable speaking up if I do see something that's not right. Uh, so I feel marginalized in my role. Uh, people don't care what I think. I'm just going to go through, go through the motions, uh, go to work, go through the motions. I'm no longer really engaged in my work. And we lose ownership and accountability. And as we lose psychological safety, the other thing is we see that errors are covered up. And we make the same mistakes over and over again because we don't, we aren't learning from our mistakes. We aren't, we don't have what we call organizational learning. So now we're getting it into, we know it's a problem. I don't think I probably had to work too hard to convince you of that, but what can we do about it? And so hopefully I can talk about some, some particular tools here. Uh, so what are your core values uh, at, at your institution? Here at Duke Health, we, our mission is caring for our patients, their loved one, and each other. And obviously you can see being disruptive, being unprofessional does not fit those values. We value teamwork, integrity, diversity, excellence, safety. And so how do you work these values, your own values in your organization, into part of the hiring process so people know from day one, this is how we behave here, this is how we treat each other here, this is what's expected of you. And we don't just do it on day one, but we are incorporating that into yearly evaluations. So it's great that this was your productivity, but how are you treating each other? Um, how, how are you living those values that we feel are important as an organization? And then the recognition that these values have to apply to everyone. Uh, it's not just, you know, for the nurses and pharmacists and respiratory therapists who have to do this, but every single person, the, the physicians are held to the same standard, the CEO, the C-suite is held to the same standard of how we treat each other. Um, and so setting that expectation early and then holding people to it, uh, maintaining that accountability. And that's where we get into role modeling, the importance of putting people in leadership roles who model this professionalism, model this respect and teamwork, and are held to those same standards that we hold our employees to. You have to set this expectation of zero tolerance because what you permit is what you promote. If you see something happening and it doesn't get addressed, you, you get that impression, hey, it's okay to behave that way. If you act out and no one says anything to you, then in your head, that's not a problem for me to act out that way or not a problem for me to make an inappropriate joke because no one cared. So it encourages you to do it again next time. So we need to not allow these behaviors to be normalized. And, and this is where we need leadership to step in and set that tone. Uh, one uh, example of how this can be done is leader walk rounds where we have executive leaders going out onto units and asking people about what's going well, what could we do better here, and then following up with these units about how they may have freed up some resources or, or maybe fix some problems on the unit. And now you start to give that staff that voice because we talked about the impact when staff doesn't have a voice, when they don't have any control, when they feel like they can't be heard. This is one way we start to build psychological safety. We start to give people that voice back um, is by giving them face time with executives. And there's a lot of good information out there around leader walkarounds. Another thing is to follow the principles of just culture. And many of you, if not most of you, are likely familiar with this. Uh, but 
if we think about the aspects of just culture, just to highlight uh, for those who may not be familiar with it, I'm going to go through real quickly. There's different aspects of behavior. We are all humans. We all make mistakes. And we have to recognize that hopefully in the morning we're going in with the concept of I'm doing the right thing for my job today. I'm going in to do the right thing for a patient. Uh, I'm not planning on hurting a patient today, but mistakes can happen, and we need to recognize that we're humans. Uh, we also do things that are sometimes a little risky uh, that may not be the right thing to do. You know, I, I'm ignoring this policy because I'm trying to do the right thing for my patient, and I didn't even realize why that policy was written. Uh, you know, as an example I give outside of the healthcare environment, I'm sure no one on this phone of the uh, you know several hundred people who are on the phone, no one has ever texted and driven at the same time. We know that's a bad idea. There may be a real reason. There may be an emergency of sort that needs to put you on your phone. And so there's a reason you're doing it. Um, but I think we all recognize it's a bad idea. Uh, and then there's truly reckless behavior. Um, and so, again, the driving example, we're talking about driving intoxicated, driving drunk, or, um, you know, driving recklessly uh, in the hospital setting. You know, I'm doing, I'm com showing complete disregard for policies. And as we think about these different things, uh, in terms of human error, uh, one best way to think about that is, hey, the nurse made a mistake in the, in the dosing uh, or the physician wrote the wrong uh, dose of the medicine. Uh, it wasn't caught by the nurse. Could we have put another physician in the same situation and writing that order? Could we have put another nurse in the same position as the nurse? And could they have made the same mistake? And if, if a different person could have made the exact same mistake, then it's not a person problem. It's a system problem. And so we need to not punish the individual for being a human, but we need to look at our system. Uh, if this was an at-risk behavior, so they ignored a policy because they were really trying to do the right thing for the patient a little bit quicker than maybe they could have otherwise, but they, this is an important policy they don't need to ignore, those are opportunities for coaching. And then when they're really being reckless, that's when we push towards disciplinary action. Or if they have this repeat at-risk behavior, that's when we look at disciplinary action. And we can think about disruptive behaviors in the same way. You know, this is someone who is professional all the time who had a really bad moment under a time of stress. Maybe then we can coach them and expect good behavior from them in the future versus this someone who is persistently inappropriate and persistently acting out. That's when we need to look at punishment and disciplinary action. So uh, to, to build this among our staff and to help support this, we want to build emotional intelligence. So look for those coaching opportunities where we can help our staff practice empathy, to recognize their own personal triggers of what gets them upset and what gets them angry, and when they do have those moments of the amygdala hijack, you know, it's, it's a little uh, cliche to say, take a deep breath and count to 10, but it actually works. The amygdala hijack we talked about is about 20 seconds long. And so if you can count to 10 to get through that and take that deep breath and then even better label the emotion, be able to just say, I'm angry and this is why I'm angry, that has a huge effect on controlling those hormones that have taken over your brain and bringing you back so your cognitive processes can take over again. So teaching people to put themselves in the other shoes and the other person's shoes. And at the end of the day, any argument I say, bring back to the concept of what's the right thing to do for the patient. And if we can focus on that constructive solution, not who is right, but what's the right thing to do, that often will bring people back together. Now, we are on the team training webinar, so I have to talk about teamwork. And there's a lot of good aspects of teamwork that we can use to support and bring down disruptive behaviors. So this goes back to that same data, data set I said earlier. And so here you can see 15 different disruptive behaviors, anything from violating HIPAA, setting up others to fail, bullying other people. And you can see when we have units that show strong teamwork versus units that have weak teamwork, black uh, versus gray, when you have really good teamwork, you see less of these disruptive behaviors across the board. Every one of these is very statistically significant, as well as uh, you can see the marked differences just visually. And so as we support teamwork and build teamwork, we will see these disruptive behaviors get better because uh, people will start working together better as a team. So every, for every 10-point increase in disruptive behavior, we see a four-point decrease in teamwork and, and, and vice versa. So what are those teamwork tools that team training, that Team Steps teaches us that we can use? Briefings and huddles, bringing the team together at set points throughout the day to talk about what's the plan, who's, who's doing what to achieve that goal, making sure we have a shared mental model. Now your team members are not working against each other, but they're working in coordination. Key information has been shared, and so everyone understands what other people are doing. You have that role clarity of understanding what my job is in our, in our mission, uh, and so all those things help bring down the stress level of the team, 
because we've now started to give people things that they can control and think and allow people to predict what's going to happen. And so their stress level comes down. And so people start working together better as a team. So this is a really key tool that can really help teams function at a higher level. Other things, teaching people how to communicate. So in these case, uh, structured communication. Uh, this might be a page I get in the middle of the night. I'm calling about Mr. Jones, the gentleman with diabetes and hypertension who went to the OR yesterday for bowel resection. He had a fever, I gave him some Tylenol. He says he's not in pain, his heart rate's up. His wife's at the bedside. So if I get this call, my initial reaction is, what do you want from me? And, and so it's setting this up for this confrontational reaction. Why are you calling me in the middle of the night? So teaching people uh, what we all know, but we don't always practice is SBAR, this idea of situation, background, assessment, recommendation. I'm calling about Mr. Jones because he has a fever and elevated heart rate. This is some important background around what's happened. I'm worried he may be septic. I think you should come see him. Now, I may not agree. I may not think that the patient's septic. I may think something else is going on, but I at least now know why they're calling me and I know where they're coming from. So we can start a conversation at a place where we understand each other. And again, it's not going to be as confrontational from the get-go. Other things, teaching people critical language, the cuss language. I'm concerned. I'm uncomfortable. This is a safety issue. Teaching people how they can speak up when they have concerns. Or teaching people the desk script. The, uh, this is how do we confront someone when we really uh, have concerns about their behavior? How, what is the language that we can use to approach them? So teaching people how to describe the specific behavior that they saw, express the effect of that behavior, what, why is that behavior a problem, and then what is a different course of action? And if, if we don't follow that different course of action, what may happen? So this all gets into the idea of giving people feedback. And whenever I talk about feedback, I show this curvy road. We don't drive along a road like this and wait until we're on the shoulder of the road and then with the wheel back. You know, we make small corrections to the car as we're going, but how often do we only meet with a staff member every six months to give them feedback, once a year to give them feedback? And so how do we develop this culture of feedback among our team that we're constantly giving each other tips and tools about how we can do better? And debriefing is a great way to do this, bringing the team together you know, asking about what did we do well, what did we learn, what we, can we do differently next time. If we routinely debrief, it gets people in that habit of giving each other feedback. And we know that teams that debrief frequently, people are more likely to speak up outside of the debrief setting as well because they're used to that. It's something that we do. We give each other that feedback, and it builds psychological safety. And then another way to give people feedback is giving them feedback directly on the disruptive behavior. And this is something that we've built out which is our professionalism accountability program or the PACT program at Duke. And this is based on work that was done at Vanderbilt by Jerry Hickson and his colleagues uh, who were really uh, trying to say, we saw a lot of patient complaints. We saw areas that had a lot of patient complaints had negative outcomes in terms of patient care, in terms of patient satisfaction. And so we need to start to address this. And so what they saw is those patient complaints, uh, there was a few physicians uh, and this was focused on the physicians initially, although we have now rolled it out to our nursing staff. Uh, but we, there's a few people who are responsible for a whole lot of the complaints. And this holds true in, in many different settings where you can see those few people who have that inordinate impact. And those are the people you really need to target, whereas everyone else you can kind of get in line because they're going to they're gonna follow the cultural norms of where they work. And so... The, the intervention that's done is a peer messenger program. Uh, I'm not going to go into great detail, but this idea of having a peer sit down with you and say, hey, we noticed this behavior. This is not okay. We need to, you know, this doesn't fit the values of our organization. It's very different having a peer tell you that as opposed to being called into the boss's office. Because when you get called into your boss's office to hear about something that you did wrong, you're going to walk in with that armor on, that defense. You're not going to listen to what they have to say, you're going to just turn around and give them all the reasons why it was okay that you yelled at that nurse, why it was okay that you made that inappropriate joke. Uh, whereas if it's a peer who's in the same situation who are, does the same work, who says, hey, you know what, there's no consequences from this right now, but that's not okay. And, and I know, you know, I know that's not like you. What, what we see is the majority of time that will fix their behavior. Now, sometimes it's a little bit more serious or it's a repeat offense, and then it gets bumped up to be an espresso. It's a more serious conversation. And then sometimes it's really egregious. And when it's really egregious, it goes right up to this authority level to, to being more punitive. So 
Uh, what we saw is the first three years of this PAC program at Duke, we had more than 400 uh, physician attending reports through PAC, about 8% of our faculty total who have had a professionalism complaint. Uh, not surprisingly, we see the complaints most often in those areas of high stress, the OR, the ED, the ICU. But what we've seen is um, with these cups of coffee that have been delivered, about 300 cups of coffee, coffee total by peer messengers throughout our institution, only about one one and a half percent of our faculty have had repeat behaviors. So for the first time, people are getting this feedback that says, hey, that's not okay. That's not the type of thing we expect here. Rain it in. I don't expect we're going to have to do this again. And most people are going to fix that on their own. And now we can really focus in on those few people who are really have that inordinate impact and getting them in line or getting them maybe a different place to work if need be. And certainly there's been some some physicians who are no longer allowed to work with trainees. There have been some physicians who are no longer with our institution because of this work. Um, but that is a, such a small number. And there are so many more people who may have just a bad moment and got some feedback on that moment and are now pulled back in, engaged in their work and a valued member of our organization. So some of the take home points and we'll get into questions and answers. So, you know, I probably don't have to convince you that disruptive behaviors, it's a pervasive problem in healthcare and it's a big problem. Uh, there's a lot of negative effects and I showed you the effects on, on every aspect of culture, but burnout, staff turnover, uh, lack of psychological safety, medical errors, and then patients and the effect on patient care, patient satisfaction, uh, patient compliance with um, our recommendations, things like that. Um, Fortunately, there are some things that you can do that can help drive these down. Role modeling, emotional intelligence, building emotional intelligence among your staff, these team training principles. Um, they're, they're common sense things, but they have a huge impact. And then finally, I talked about the professionalism accountability program that we built out, uh, again, modeled on the Vanderbilt program. So at that point, I am going to turn over to go to questions. And uh, I think Chris has been collecting some of those. I wasn't able to keep up with the chat while we went. Uh, but uh, any questions from the group? Definitely have a lot of great questions that have come in and questions that have come in, you know, earlier as well. Uh, so uh, start off, you know, there are those four major strategies you just had up on the screen with role modeling and team training and, and, and the, peer, uh, the peer messengers and such. Is there a certain kind of Escalation or order, you think, to rolling those types of things out? Is it something that you want to you know, try to roll out all at once, or how, how do you think you should go about doing that? So I think it this gets into uh, a, broad, a more broad topic of trying to really understand culture in your work area. So um, and and using culture surveys um, that everyone pretty much does some version of a culture survey to really look, again, culture is local. In that area, if you're seeing a lot of disruptive behaviors, is it a leadership problem? What are the views of that leader in that area? Uh, is it a teamwork problem? Do we have really low teamwork scores there? And so if we can bump up the teamwork scores, there's a good chance the disruptive behaviors are going to get better. Or Again, is it, does it seem to be a few individuals or maybe even one group of individuals? Um, and I'll pick on the physicians because they're often labeled, although to, we have gotten a fair number of data that shows that the, the exposure to disruptive behaviors and also the, the perpetration by disruptive behaviors crosses across all of our specialties. Um, but maybe it's the, it's the physicians there who really have a problem, and then there may be that peer messenger program may be the thing that gives you the most bang for your buck. So you do have to do a little legwork, a little pre-work to try to figure out what's the, you know, what's the culture like in this area and what's, what's the biggest area that we could address, that low-hanging fruit that we can try to fix and then apply uh, the appropriate strategy. Got it. So a bunch of people have asked this. What, what, what if the leader is the problem? And, we, you know, we're talking about, you know, maybe the, you know, the head of the department or division or you know, if we're thinking about the medical office, let's, you know, not to take on the physician, but let's say it's a small medical office and, and you know, the few partner physicians are, are the problem. What, what does the staff do in that situation? So I think the what the staff has to do is ideally uh, have who is, if, if there is a leader above that leader um, to, you know, that they, they can set the tone and, and really say this is something that's important. But um, the other thing that people can do is give feedback in a way that's not, you know, we don't like it when you act like this, but to bring it back to what's the mission of our clinic? What's the mission of our hospital? You know, we want to take care of the patients the best way possible. And this gets into that desk script that we teach through Team Steps of, 
this particular behavior, you know, the other day when I called you on the phone um, and you were pretty short with me and, and you kind of, you know, um, got on me about calling you, what that does, that leaves me with the feeling that, um, you know, I, I, it makes me hesitate before I call you. And I worry that that's going to hurt our patient because sometime when I need to call you about a patient, I'm not going to call you because I'm afraid to call you because of the way that you've acted to me on the phone. Um, and so you, however you're, you can give feedback to that person that ties their behavior with the direct consequence to the mission is, is the best way to start that conversation. Got it. Got it. Thanks. Um, let's see. So what about, um, to, all right, what about if the, the situation is not a disruptive, uh, you know, coworker, uh, but it's a disruptive patient or family member or someone else that's causing that, that particular problem? Any advice around that? I know it's probably, it's not the same. You're not having coffee with them and doing things like that, but how could you address that? Yeah, it's 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 not the same, but there are some principles that are certainly overlap. And and again, that's kind of, uh, in some ways it's its own topic, but but some of the same strategies can be applied. And unfortunately, we're also have seen a huge uptick in disruptive patients and families, and the stress of our current situation in the United States obviously is going to build on that as well. Um, so some of the key things I mentioned: setting early expectations, making an expectation when that patient is brought in the health system of these are the behaviors that we expect of you. And these are the behaviors you expect from us as caretakers. And so setting those expectations early, being consistent so that you don't have a patient who says, oh, they, that patient down the hall got away with it, but why can't I get away with it? So you have to be consistent. You can't permit it from one person, but not from another. So consistency in how you deal with patients and issues. Um, and then using peer, you know, peer messengers may not be another patient, but advocates, patient advocates, using the folks like that so the patient feels like it's someone who's on their side, uh, but yet is still giving them feedback around that these behaviors are not okay. And it's not okay because it's hurting your loved one. It's hurting the ability for the medical team to care for your loved one. Uh, so again, bringing it back to what's the shared goal of the patient and or the, or the family member and the shared goal of the health system is to try to get that, that person better. And if patients are acting out in ways that, that hurt the care team's ability to care for the patient, then that's when it has to be addressed um, and, and giving feedback in that setting. I love that, that idea of the shared goal. Um, you know, it's, it's something that I think is also really pertinent. If somebody else had a question here about, you know, how do we hear our physicians' frustration on burnout uh, and, and, you know, help them while also asking them to help us by not being disruptive? And it's about those shared goals, right? It's, it's yeah. all along the same line, yeah. And so as you mentioned that, yeah. as you mentioned that, Chris, I see another question kind of talking about how do we hear the frustrations of our staff. Um, and yeah. and uh, so... I mentioned walk rounds earlier. That's one of one of the strategies. Uh, debriefing, maybe not around a patient event, but around work culture is another way to get people talking about it. And we've actually done some debrief around culture surveys. Uh, when we've done this at Duke, we've identified areas that are struggling in more than one area, uh, or work settings that are that are really struggling. And what we 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 set up some criteria, and we say teams that are in the or work settings that are in the lowest decile for teamwork and also in the lowest decile for burnout. And we're going to go talk to them about what's going on there. And we have an external leader who comes in and just has a debrief with them and kind of what's going well here, what can be done better. And what we've seen is those conversations, we give feedback to the leaders in those areas, and we've seen improvements on the next culture survey uh, pretty consistently. So those types of debriefing events can be pretty useful. Do you – all right, so what do you do with people that have been long-term – having long-term issues? So we're talking about individuals who are, you know, have been really causing problems for years, right? Like how do you all of a sudden start a program like this? How do you get down that, that path? And, and that's a, a real key issue that is, is tough to face because we talk about what you permit is what you promote. If you've been permitting it for 20 years, it's hard to come back now and say, oh, wait, now it's not okay. Um, right. And it, it, takes a, it takes somewhat of a powerful statement from hopefully those highest leaders in the organization to say, yes, some of these behaviors have been allowed in the past, but 
it's we we have come to realize it's not okay and particularly if you can bring data that shows why it's not okay and so uh so there's certainly published data you probably also can pull data from your own organization that shows that you know the relation between patient complaints and poor outcomes in patient care uh between turnover in uh staff things like that um where you can say we now know this is a problem uh so data can help uh at the same time um you know making it non-threatening at the beginning so you don't set up this immediate conflict in the pits of this, which is where we found the peer messenger program helps in more because you, you have a peer coming in and saying, look, this isn't okay. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, we have had to make some hard decisions. And sometimes you have people who have, you know, maybe a lot of influence, a lot of research dollars who come in and, and you still have to be firm with them and say, these behaviors are not tolerable anymore, even though you may have been doing them for a long time. They're not tolerable anymore. This is why. Um, and that can be a real hard conversation to have. Yes, you've obviously have HR on your side in, in these situations. And I'm assuming that, you know, for example, with the coffee cup to the espresso to the, you know, going to authority, they're, they're all, they've, they've, they've bought into this. The, the at, at, yeah, absolutely. And so here, you know, with that type of program as opposed to this is a one-on-one -on -one conversation about professionalism, but we've instituted a program across the health system, then obviously you've got that leadership buy-in, and which is it's huge in building that leadership. When it's the leader who's the disruptive one, that's where it's can, it can be hard to, to get that ball rolling in the same way, um, but it's, it still can happen. And uh, I have ha talked to other organizations who have made progress a little bit at a time, but finally have gotten either new leadership involved or uh, a leader who was disruptive for a long time who has kind of come around to the new way of thinking and understanding how problematic the behaviors can be. Now, this is all su such an important thing to be thinking about, especially right now. What can you do, I guess, the last question here is, is you know, right now in light of the stressful situation folks are under and you know, oh, we don't want to implement a program or, oh, it's going to be hard to start, you know, uh, you know, doing some of these team training tools right now. What's what's the one thing? What's the easy win of all the things that you've been doing at Duke that you think people can take home right now and help today? You know, I, I I'm I'm a teamwork guy. I'm one of our team steps trainers, and so I think as an individual, the things that you can do right off are to start looking at um, some of those things that you can improve team communication and you can see some pretty big benefits from that. So the things I would talk about is are there ways amongst your team to start to do those briefings and huddles to get your team on the same page um, and then as well debriefings. Just talk about performance. Uh, pull that in. How are there ways that we can just say, you know, how can we do this better next time? And people can start to feel like, hey, it's safe to speak up. We give each other feedback. And that then can open the door for some of the harder conversations like these peer messenger conversations. Got it. Well, oh, thank you. Thank, I'd like to thank you for, you know, being on today and, and spending an hour with us to do this. I really appreciate that. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody that joined in today, the hundreds of you that did that. Um, we really appreciate, like I said, <laughs> you doing everything that you're doing right now in the field, our heartfelt gratitude uh, to all of you. Thank you so much. Uh, we are going to be sending out an evaluation for this, so please, you know, look for that. That's always important. We always look over that uh, on a monthly basis to see what people said. Uh, you can download the information uh, in the file pod about how to get the CE credit. You can download the slides there. Uh, and then you'll also be receiving a message when we have the recording of this video ready to share with you. So with that, thank you all, uh, and, and stay safe out there. Thanks, Chris, and thank you all to everything you do. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's presentation. You may now disconnect.